In this episode of Undictated, we get context on the arrest of Dudu Mieni, the chair of South African Airways from 2012 to 2017. Her corrupt activities were first exposed in a May 2020 judgment, and that was in a court case, brought against her by Outa and the South African Airways Pilot Association. Wayne Duvenage from Outer, the chief executive, was instrumental in bringing that court case in the first instance, and we'll get context from him why and exactly what's going on right now. And indeed, there was so much in that judgment which said she should be going to jail for decades that nothing, nothing's happened there. But in the magistrate's court, they're talking about a 300,000 rand bribe that she received from Basasa. So what gives on all of this? Hey, Wayne, good to be talking. Well, I suppose on the one hand, you're quite happy that Dudu Mjeni is finally getting some comeuppance. But if you go back into your court case, and I've read through uh, the 114-page judgment, there was so much in there that should be putting this former primary school teacher behind bars for a long, long, long time. And now we wait until 2023, the judgment, what's it now, three years ago. And only now is she being... Uh, really, well, she was released on 10,000 Rand bail. So it shows you it's not exactly a, a, you know, a big issue. What's happening here? Sure, Eric. I mean, uh, you know, one would have hoped that in a normal society where the rule of law flows, uh, flows swiftly and um, accountability is meted out, that she would have been in orange overalls by today. But unfortunately, we're not in that situation in South Africa. And... Um, there are all the constraints in the criminal justice system, uh, which makes this lethargic. It makes it really time-consuming. So I think we've got to, first of all, be glad with the fact that that something is now starting to come to the fore. I don't think the NPA and the Hawks would have arrested her and uh, put her uh, into the courts for, uh, in, and her pl- application for bail if there was nothing there. I think they've got a strong case. So she's now going to be facing the music. But just to you know, take you back, why we went the route that we did to have a declared delinquent. I think, you know, if you recall those days, state capture, although well, it hadn't been coined then when she was in full flow at SAA with all her shenanigans, the BNP capital case where she tried to set up a situation where 249 million rand would flow to a boutique finance house where Cynthia Stumple was the treasury manager of it, says, we do this work. We do it internally. We've got all the processes in play. Why on earth would you want to outsource this? And when she approached us, we could see what was going on. Um, and, and Dudu was headlines on a regular basis throughout that period. Had no idea of how to run an airline. Uh, was interfering in the operations as the chair, as the non-exec chairperson, uh, got rid of good people, good people like Sylvain Bosk, Wolf, uh, Mayer, Cynthia, Tulium Sher, and others that um, were doing a good job in keeping that airline, you know, in 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 the black. The, it was a good airline up until that stage, and it collapsed very shortly and found itself in public re- in, in in business rescue, all because of the loss of that talent and the mismanagement and the games that were being played with herself, Yaki Quinane, uh, Nancy, uh, and, and, and others that were put in there to plunder, as far as I'm concerned, to, to wreck a, social, a, a state-owned entity that received billions of rands of bailouts after that. It's a classic. Yeah. Put in by who, Wayne? Uh, we believe it's Jacob Zuma. He, she was very close to him. She was his, the 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 uh, chairperson of the Jacob Zuma Foundation. Uh, and you know, Dudu played a classic case of the middleman. We found her even in Eskom interfering with operations and boards and decisions that were taking place. She was on, on the Mtlatuzi Mtlatuzi Water Board, uh, and uh, and at Centlec. Um, I think it was one of those other communications companies and well the big fish for her was 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 SAA as the chairperson and um and this was the classic case of state capture you know put people into positions of power who can make decisions that will manipulate flow of funds 
interconnected cronies' pockets from where the money then flows back to the patronage uh, structures that uh, are very complex, but but it's a it's simple in its in its execution when you have the power that Jacob Zuma had. Quite brutal. We recall Nenegate. We also recall why Nenegate happened, and it was all to do with Dudu. Dudu wanted her way. Ntlantla Neni said no. Jacob Zuma fired Dudu, uh, uh, Ntlantla. And as a consequence of that, the South African economy took an awful smack. The rand fell out of bed. We had Des van Royen pulled into Treasury. It was almost like a coordinated uh, an attack on South Africa's Treasury. But that goes back to, as we well know, to 2015. So now we are eight years later, and all she's being tackled on is security upgrades to a house in Richards Bay by Bosasa and some travel and, and hotel bills that Bosasa paid for her, 300,000 rand in total. It, as a member of the public, when you look at this, you say, what the heck is going on here? Are they trying to do an Al Capone? In other words, they couldn't get Al Capone for killing so many people in Chicago, the gangster boss, but they did get him on tax fraud. Could it be something like that? I think it is, uh, Alec. Uh, you know, the NPI has to be seen to be moving forward, and here's a here's a kingpin in the whole state capture saga. Uh, well, not a kingpin, but an important cog in it. And um, and uh, you know, the 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 court challenge that we had uh, declaring her delinquent for life. There was so much evidence in there, and the judge passed that on to the NPA and said, "Here." get this information, do the investigations, and do what you have to do. And I think what they're doing, there's some, there's some conflict of interest issues that are coming out of that case that are in this latest charge as well. And um, I believe there will be more cases flowing. So to get the ball rolling, and I think the NPA have learned now, do not bring these big complex cases with multiple charges that take ages and the filibustering and the Stalingrad st uh, strategies play out. Br simplify and bring multiple separate cases because eventually one does stick and make sure they're all strong. And I think that's the strategy uh, with Dudu Mnieni. So that's the context of all of this. Uh, it isn't saying that she was innocent of all the other crimes against South Africa, but actually this is one that you can hit her with quickly, put her behind bars, and then bring the rest of them. Because I guess when you have a, a, a very powerful person, and Jacob Zuma is still a very powerful politician. He's got lots of followers. Heaven knows why. Uh, it seems people, not everybody reads and not everybody actually opens their minds. But you can do that as a starting point and perhaps some of those will turn around. I, I want to just remind you of what happened with um, VBS. I, if you recall the, the whole VBS saga, all the inside people initially gave one story until they were told that if they told the truth, they would be immune from prosecution. And as a consequence, something like a dozen of the employees at VBS changed their stories 180 degrees. In other words, if they said it was day, suddenly it became night. They told the truth afterwards. That was very efficiently used in the VBS story. Isn't there a case maybe for using something similar? Because it seems at the moment that the NPA or certainly the uh, police or the legal enforcement authorities are struggling to get witnesses to put a person like this behind bars who should have been behind bars a long time ago. Yeah. You know, uh, Alec, you open a, 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 an interesting debate in the discussion on on this whole issue of an amnesty. Uh, Tuli Madanjela has spoken about it briefly, and I agree a lot with him. Now, the first normal reaction to this discussion is no, no amnesty. Everybody get behind bar. But the extent and the depth of the corruption that we've endured as a country is going to take years, if not decades. Saw so the Azonda Commission and the years that it took to do all of this. So, so I believe, personally, that like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, as, was, as you spoke about now on the BBS matter, could take us forward quickly. So imagine the scenario, and you had to put in place the, the teams, the processes, the people, the whole mechanism. 
of a truth and reconciliation, but it's but it's now a a, a, a truth and uh, uh, you know amnesty process for corruption from X date to Y date, um, and <laughs> the process goes along these lines. You tell the whole truth. You miss one element that is pertinent, and everything falls away for you. The second part then, because now as people tell the truth, they start implicating others. The second part is you give back everything that you've gained. So you tell us where the assets are, and if we find out otherwise, again, you lose out. You go to jail. So that house overseas, that Lamborghini park, those all come back to the state. They get sold. The money comes back in. Your benefit in all of this is you don't go to jail, but you still live the life that your friends and family and everybody starts questioning you. You become ostracized in society. So you stay out of jail, we get our money back, and we move on with life uh, and get the stuff behind us. Now, the web that starts. So somebody doesn't want to come forward, but he's implicated or she's implicated. And so you start incarcerating those people. I can tell you that that to me would be the best way forward. It's not like I'm saying, let's get every, let everybody get off the hook. This is where the house of cards comes crumbling down for the connected cronies within the ruling party who are central to the corruption. This is where uh, the detail comes out on Jacob Zuma, on everybody else. And, uh, and you can't hide from that process because... If you want to stay out of it and you're implicated and you're found guilty, it's a long time in jail and you still lose everything. Think about it. I think we've got something to really discuss and talk about in the amnesty process. Otherwise, we'll sit here. Uh, you and I will have left this planet and uh, and they'll still be trying. It'll, it'll all dissipate anyway over the next 10 years. Not going to happen. Something definitely has to be done differently because we know – uh, the evidence is very clear in many respects. But maybe revisit uh, what uh, was it Advocate Matau uh, did in the VBS saga. Because he from a, from a hopeless case, but bringing in, I think it was an American law that we brought into South Africa, which gives people immunity if they tell the truth. Bringing that in, in that one instance, broke it open. And what you're saying now, and I guess what Tuli Madoncela, as the former public protector, when it was still a very reputable position, told her, tells us is let's do the same thing again. Let's let's uh, well, let's consider it. How would that happen? When would who who would have to make that call? So so it would have to be, I think, the president. Maybe this is something that we could we could call for a referendum on, but it's going to be complex. And again, the, the emotional knee-jerk reaction is no. But I think we have this debate. It's going to, like the truth and reconciliation process, remember also complex undoing the evils and getting the truth out there on, on the apartheid crimes, uh, same thing. So this is state capture crimes or corruption crimes uh, for, for a certain period. You have to put in place the process. So like uh, uh, Desmond Tutu headed it up, you would have somebody of that stature heading it up. And as the Zonda Commission process was put in place, so so too will this. All the teams, the, the information flowing in, the, the uh, secure uh, whistleblowing databases, the information coming in, it's going to be complex and it's going to be lengthy, but it's going to be far shorter <laughs> than what we're going through now. And I, within a few years, I think we'll learn so much and see who has been implicated, and we will recover a lot, and we will have a lot of people put away, and 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 and, and most of them who do come forward living with the shame of their role in state capture for the rest of their lives, and probably never being able to work in government again, hopefully, and then anyway, they'll pay the price. Let me tell you, there will be there will be accountability meted out in that process. It's a great idea, Wayne, but getting back to Dudu Mieni, how the devil did she get such a very powerful position being as incompetent as she is in the first place? I guess, I guess you can say and ask the same question about many people in many positions of power and in cabinet uh, of, of the ruling party. So uh, Dudu Mieni, as you say, a qualified uh, teacher, primary school teacher, uh, very close to the president, 
uh, it's patronage. It's um, there, there are no rules that says you have to have a master's or this qualification or that qualification. It is a non-executive director position. And uh, he used his powers uh, or sent, certainly lent on the people that needed to exercise those powers to have her appointed. That's simple. Uh, with the intent, with the message to go in there and make way for the procurement processes. So remember, there was the Airbus deal. And Airbus, fortunately, said, not on our watch. Uh, you know, we, she was trying to cancel them and, and take the leases of these planes through other uh, middlemen. So the thing about procurement in government is you have layers of facilitation fees and facilitators and people and middlemen. Uh, that's exactly on the BNP capital matter as well, where they all get their cut, where they all justify some markup. Uh, and, and and that's where the funds, funds flow, as I say. So how... I mean, we all said that. Uh, how on earth? I think she took over from Cheryl Corollas and others who just decided they were going to get out of there because this was this was uh, this was non-compliance on steroids um, and bad governance. And uh, did you find a way into that spot? Not dif- not difficult to to do that. The plundering started. Russell Loebscher, very respected businessman, former CEO of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, very involved still at First Rand Group said at the time after he and he was one of the directors who left with Cheryl Corollas, he said that he has never seen as useless a director on Biz News as Dudumieni. Now we're going back to again seven, eight years ago, with that kind of disendorsement, if you like, you have to look at us as a society and say, well, why did we accept it? Why did this society accept all of this stuff was very much in the public domain, or is there? Are we accused as a society of not giving a damn? And I think you have to exclude activists like yourself from this. But generally, the South African society doesn't something like that. Wouldn't that have moved people to perhaps been a little bit more attentive? You see, yeah, Alec, it's a good question. What happens in life is that. Uh, Journalists like yourselves and the, the free press raise the concerns. The public read this information with, 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 with they become aghast by these appointments. But, but people move on. And this is how government operates in this space. It's headlines today. It's gone tomorrow. I sweat a bit with a few questions asked. And they carry on. The business world, and we're all trying to get on with our busy pace of lives. We're frustrated. We express our concerns and social media and, and everywhere. And government just doesn't give a damn. So civil society activists like ourselves bury ourselves in saying, no, we can't let go. We have to hold her to account in some way. You know, we were laying charges against various ministers and as well for their conduct. We knew that those were being sidelined and put into the bottom shelf while Sean Abrams was in power, but we also knew that laying those charges will be used one day when the rule of law starts to come to the fore. And it's easier doing it now than trying to do it five years later when the evidence is gone, whistleblowers have moved on, and it looks like a witch hunt. So there's a lot of cases that are with the NPA, ourselves, and Corruption Watch, Helen Suzman Foundation, a lot of good civil society organizations have seized these uh, opportunities. And, and now that's playing out in Dudu's case. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's a case of citizens becoming apathetic to it. I think we become numb to you know. Fifteen years ago, a, a fraud case or a corruption case of a million rand was was horrible. You don't bat an eyelid uh, on, on a billion rand case now. It just got bigger and bigger. The brazenness and the clear intent of a corrupt government was there for all to see and exposed during the Zonda Commission. And I think to guard ourselves, to pr- protect ourselves from the stress and anxiety, as human beings, we switch off. We just say, somebody will do do something about this. Uh, and, and somebody being civil society can't get to everything. So fortunately, we get to some of the big issues. Uh, but too much, is, too much just slips through the cracks because we, you know, we're, not, we're not big enough. We should uh, just out ourselves. We should be three times outside if we were going to get to the stuff that we have to turn away. 
shell-shocked South Africa. Uh, closing off with, they are nailing her on Bosasa. Bosasa was a heck of a much bigger scandal or fraud than just 300,000 rand uh, that uh, Dudum Yeni and Trevor Mtunja got. So are we expecting more on that front as well? I think so. You know, uh, Angela Greasy's statements uh, let the cat out of the bag on so much. And Bursasa, by the way, was headline news. They were thick in the, in uh, as thieves in corruption uh, for many, many years, Gavin Watson and his cronies, uh, with all the contracts they were getting in the prisons and, and, and so forth. So um, that uh, Bursasa uh, dealings over over decades is still going to come to the fore, but uh, Dudumnyeni is just one small element uh, in that, and uh, and uh, we hope that that sticks and that she's um, held accountable. Thanks for the context. Wayne Duvenage is the chief executive of the organisation Undoing Tax Abuse. Arta, I'm Alec Hogg for Undictated of Biznews.com.